open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56 degrees. Hi, everybody. It's really amazing to be here. It's really thrilling to be here. I want to thank Beth and everybody at the Coolidge Corner Theater. Um, you do amazing work. I'm a big fan of the theater, and it's, it's just, I'm so excited to be here. So let's get started. We have a lot we want to talk about. Uh, talk about the movie Tenet. So the title of this talk is Paradoxes, Entropy, and the Arrow of Time. I'm Jacob Barandes. Uh, let's get started. So we're going to start with uh, a, a construct from history, a little history before we get into the science. This is the Sater Square. Um, my uh, high school Latin teacher would be upset with my pronunciation. Uh, I, I think I'm supposed to pronounce this Sator Square. It's an artifact. The first known example of it goes back to um, uh, the city of Pompeii, which was destroyed uh, by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in uh, the year 79. I'm going to take a look at it for just a moment. I'll talk in more detail about it. But uh, it's a set of palindromes. In particular, I want to call your attention to a couple of the, the words on here. One is, is sator, sator, uh, arepo, arepo, uh, tenet, right, while we're all here, opera, opera, and rotas. Uh, these will all feature in the movie. Uh, the words also appear vertically as well. So this is the first known example of the Sator Square. Again, this was found in Pompeii. It was graffitied on a wall. Um, there's the city of Pompeii on a map, if you don't know. Its closest translation is um, the farmer, Arepo, works the wheels, presumably of the plow. All right, that's enough of, of history. I'm a physicist. Let's talk, let's, let's talk physics, OK? We're here to talk physics. OK. So there's a couple of terms that are going to come up in the movie, and I want to talk about them right now with all of you. One is the grandfather paradox. Another is the Wheeler-Feynman one-electron universe theory, entropy, and the second law of thermodynamics. I'm going to talk about all of these and hopefully explain what they all mean. Let's start with the grandfather paradox. In some ways, it's the simplest of these to describe. So, how does the story go of the grandfather paradox? Some of you may have heard of this before. If you travel back in time and you somehow prevent your grandfather from meeting your grandmother, it, it, sometimes the story is told you kill your grandfather, but uh, that's a little morbid, especially these days. You, just, you, you, you somehow prevent this, this meeting from happening. Well, then you wouldn't have been born. But if you were never born, then you couldn't have traveled back in time in the first place. Looks like we have a paradox. Now, there are a couple of ways that one can deal with this. It depends on what kind of a universe you're imagining. Uh, one version is if you go back in time and prevent your grandparents from meeting each other, then you create a new timeline. If you want a new universe with a new story, leaving your old universe behind. So I guess you'd continue to exist, I, I suppose. Um, but another, another model that some movies use for this story is that there is, is, in fact, just one history. There is one way everything has played out. All the time travelers are all part of that written history. So the fact that you exist means that whatever time travelers went back in time and did whatever they did, the result was that the two people who your grandparents ultimately met, and there's really nothing anyone can do about it. This kind of a universe is, uh, I guess, kind of described by fate. Uh, I don't know what kind of a universe Tenet's supposed to be, but I guess you can make up your own mind. All right, next let's talk about the Wheeler-Feynman one electron universe. What, what is this about? So let's draw a picture. I'm going to draw a picture of space and time. That space, you have to forgive me, I, the, the visuals are a, a little limited here. Space is actually three-dimensional, but I have a two-dimensional screen I'm trying to use here. And I need to save one dimension for time. So you have to imagine that space represents all of space in all directions. And here we've added a dimension. Time is not a direction in space. It's just a way for us to keep track of things as they happen in time. 
an object at rest that we think of as a rest that just sits there, like my smartphone is sitting here on the table, uh, appears to move upward in this picture. You think of that as my, my smartphone, okay? Why is it moving? It's not actually moving in space. It's in the same place. It's just that we're following it as time goes by. If you've ever seen a seismograph, you know, that they use to, to detect earthquakes, you know what this looks like. There's a ticker tape that's going through and a little needle drawing a line. And the ticker tape keeps unrolling. So if there's no earthquake, you get a straight line. If there's an earthquake, then it oscillates from side to side. That represents something actually happening. Here, nothing is actually happening. Now, an object that's moving through space in this picture is going to trace at a diagonal line. Again, the diagonal line is misleading. It's really only moving in this picture, it'll be moving to your, uh, your right. Um, but in this picture, because we're following it as it goes through time, it'll appear to go in a diagonal line. So the object will look like this. Physicists love drawing these kinds of diagrams. Okay. Now, in 1940, uh, the theoretical physicist John Wheeler called up Richard Feynman, who was uh, actually his uh, thesis student, um, although this was after you know, R Richard Feynman had graduated and, and gone into his career. John Wheeler was a very whimsical character. Uh, if you don't believe me, um, look up the essay he once uh, wrote, I think it was based on a talk he gave called It From Bit, that uh, argued that all of physics could be derived from the processing of information. It is a whimsical essay. Uh, he was a whimsical guy, famous for popularizing the term black hole. He did not coin the term, uh, but he made it uh, well known. Before then, they were widely known as gravitationally completely collapsed objects, which <laughs> doesn't, doesn't quite have the ring to it. <laughs> anyway, he called up Richard Feynman. And John Wheeler, he said, I know why all electrons have the same charge and the same mass. An electron is a very tiny particle. You might remember from high school chemistry, they go around the nucleus of the atom, electrons move through wires, and they give us our electronic age. It's, they're kind of a big deal. Okay. But they're all exactly the same. There's an old saying, once you've seen one electron, you've seen them all. <laughs> Feynman uh, responded, well, why? And Wheeler said, because they are all the same electron. What, what did he mean by this? I should just make a, a note here. This is not generally believed by physicists today. But it's a very interesting picture and one that comes up in the movie, as you'll see. So what's going on here? Well, here's what the electron sees. In Wheeler's imagining, the electron could go sometimes forward in time, and sometimes it could go backward in time. Uh, it changes time direction when it hits what, for reasons you'll see when you watch the movie, I'll call a turnstile. So here is our electron. It's moving through space. Again, the diagonal direction is misleading. It's really just moving to the side, but time is propagating forward. And then it hits a turnstile. I've changed this color to indicate that now it will be going backward in time. When you see the movie, you'll understand why I'm using red and blue here goes backward in time now until it hits another turnstile. Then it starts going forward in time again. Okay? This is what the electron sees. From the electron's point of view, it is simply growing older, aren't we all? And it's seeing the world first going forward, and then it sees the world around it going backward, and then it sees the world going forward again. Its experience, from its point of view, seems to be constantly moving forward in its own notion of time. But now let's ask what the rest of us would see. Okay. Here's what the outside world would see in this picture. We first see one particle, and the particle moves as time progresses. But then something very funny happens over there at a location displaced from the particle we were looking at. And it looks like two particles have suddenly appeared from nothing. As time progresses, Two of the particles meet and annihilate, and one particle continues. It looks like we've had several particles in this story, particles that appeared from nothing and then disappeared into nothing. But really, these were all just the same particle. At least, this is the, the Wheeler-Feynman picture. 
Now, if this is really what all electrons are, and, and we'll, it's, the argument is a little, more, a little more subtle, the backward time going electrons were supposed to be antiparticles called uh, positrons. Um, Feynman naturally asked, well, why aren't there the same number of electrons as positrons if this is the story? And, and Wheeler couldn't answer the question. OK, fine. It's good for movies, though. <laughs> All right, now let's turn to entropy. What is entropy? Well, entropy is just a counting up of possibilities in powers of 10. I'll explain why. The word itself comes from n, meaning internal, and trope, meaning growth, like an internal growth, like um, it makes it sound like mildew or something, but okay. let's break down these statements and explain why they're connected. But this is the key takeaway. Okay? This is, if you remember one thing about entropy from this discussion, it's that boxed statement. Entropy is just a counting of possibilities in powers of 10. Now, I have to include an obligatory note. This is Brookline. <laughs> For the experts in the audience, there are actually several different kinds of entropy. There's even a story that Claude Shannon, who devised yet one more kind of entropy, uh, couldn't come up with what to call his discovery. And the mathematician John von Neumann told him, call it entropy. No one knows what that is, so you won't get any questions. OK. The version we're using here is the simplest and most relevant to the physics in question. So this is, this is legit. It's just one kind of entropy, but the kind that's relevant to the movie. We'll need one more pair of conceptual ingredients. The first is the notion of a macro state. This is what physicists call a simplified overall description of some state of affairs. This is the overview of some situation as the macro state. A microstate is a detailed, fine-grained description of a particular situation. This is the specifics. Okay? Example, a macrostate would be, oh, there's a bunch of people in the theater, a couple hundred people in the theater. A microstate would be a detailed accounting of all of your names, ages, social security number. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm not Facebook. I apologize. Okay. We should edit that out. I don't want to get sued. Okay. All right. So what is the entropy of a macrostate? Entropies are assigned to macrostates. Well, the entropy of a macrostate is just a counting up of all the different possible microstates, all the different possible specifics that are compatible with that macrostate. We count in powers of 10 because possibilities grow very quickly. Powers of 10 help us keep the numbers manageable. How do we count in powers of 10? Okay, well, one, one is called the zeroth power of 10. 10 is called the first power of 10. 100, that's 10 times 10, or 10 squared, that's the second power of 10. 1,000, that's 10 times 10 times 10. 10 to the third power, that's the third power of 10. And you can go on and on. 1 million, that's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. That's 10 to the sixth power. That's the sixth power of 10. 1 billion is... 10 to the ninth power, that's the ninth power of 10. You can see that counting powers makes our lives easier. Even a billion is just the number nine. This helps keep big numbers manageable. Let's do a quick example. Suppose my macro state is, I'm thinking of a one digit number. Well, what are the possible details that could underlie that macro state? I could be thinking of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Not 10, I'm thinking of a one digit number, but there are 10 possibilities if you remember to include 0. Well, 10 possibilities, that's 1 power of 10, so the entropy of the macro state, I'm thinking of a one, of a one digit number, its entropy is 10. All right, let's do another example. Suppose I'm thinking of a nine digit number. Okay. There are a lot of microstates. Here are a few of them. And if you continue this list for a long time, you'll eventually end up here. There are actually one billion possibilities here. That's nine powers of 10. So the entropy of this macrostate is nine. See, again, entropy keeps these big numbers manageable. Okay. So entropy is just counting possibilities. 
What if the number of possibilities is between powers of 10? Like, uh, I've got seven possibilities. I'm thinking of a number from one to seven, or 126 possibilities, or this number, 1,560,843,452. That's no problem. You just use decimals for things between powers of 10. So seven possibilities that's between uh, one and 10, so it, it gets an entropy that's sort of between uh, the zeroth power and the first power. So it's 0.845. 126 gets an entropy of 2.10, and this much larger number gets an entropy of 9.19. It's a little more than a billion. A billion would be the ninth power of 10. So notice entropy, again, it converts uh, big numbers to small manageable numbers. That's why it's so convenient. The game of poker is a great example of entropy and action. We can think of poker as applied entropy. Here are the poker rules we need in case you don't remember how to play poker or never learned it. It's okay. You start with five standard playing cards. That's your hand. And then when it's your turn, you throw one card away and you pick one card randomly from the deck. You win if you have the rarest combination of cards in your hand when the hand ends. A specific co combination of cards in your hand, a specific detailed, I have ace of hearts, I have queen of spades, four of clubs, five of clubs, six of diamonds, that specific configuration is one microstate, one detailed description. The simplified overall description, that's the macrostate. Okay, so here's some examples. And again, lower entropy means fewer possible microstates means rarer, fewer ways to achieve it. Okay. Royal flush. A royal flush is when you have the cards ace, king, queen, jack, ten, all in the same suit. That's very rare. There are only four ways to do that. It's got an entropy of 0 0.602. A straight is when you just have cards in order, numerical order, without regard to suit. That's rare, but not as rare. There's actually over 10,000 ways to do that. It's got an entropy of 4.01. One pair, if you have one pair of cards, two fours, let's say, and nothing else of interest. There's over one million ways to get one pair, right? Different individual configurations that, that, that correspond to the macro state one pair. That's got an entropy of a little over six. And having no patterns at all, any uh, importance, uh, that's only slightly more. That's got an entropy of 6.11. So you can see one pair is not a very good hand. What does entropy have to do with disorder? People are always saying, well, entropy is a measure of disorder. Well, the relationship, at least for the notion of entropy we use in physics, is somewhat indirect. Notice that the more orderly poker hands have lower entropy. Why is this generally true? Well, it's because there are fewer possible ways to be orderly than to be disorderly, right? If I describe something and say it's macro state is some particular thing that happens to be nice and well ordered, there are just fewer different specific micro states, fewer combinations that will produce that simple um, case, uh, orderly case. Something that, that is highly disordered can be achieved in many, many different ways. So that's why this is generally true. And remember, entropy counts possibilities. So macro states that are highly disordered, which have many possibilities, have a higher entropy. What does entropy have to do with the direction of time? This feature is very prominently in the movie. Well, suppose you start with a great hand, like a royal flush or even just a straight. Do you typically expect your hand to get better with each throw and pick or get worse? Well, you may get a lucky break occasionally. In that case, the entropy would go down. You get a rarer hand. But most of the time, your hand, it gets worse. So the entropy usually gets bigger. This is just probability at work. Okay? This happens because it's just the nature of probability that you're more likely to end up in situations with more possibilities than fewer possibilities. A big object, a balloon, a car, a person, even a bullet, is made up of a trillion, trillion particles or more. Suppose we played poker with a hand made up of a trillion, trillion cards drawing from an even bigger deck. Not five cards drawing from a deck of 52, but a trillion, trillion cards from a deck even bigger than that. Well, the entropy would be overwhelmingly likely to grow with each throw and pick. And after a bunch of throws and picks, you would find yourself in a macro state of really sort of maximal entropy. 
You could wait the age of the universe. You'll never get a straight in that hand, let alone a royal flush if you have a hand of a trillion trillion cards. And if you were to watch this game unfold, watch someone playing this game with a trillion trillion poker cards in their hand, what you'd see is the entropy steadily rise as time goes forward. If you watched a video replay of the story, you could tell if you were watching the video forward or backward based on what's happening to the entropy of the hand. If the entropy is growing, that means you're watching the video forward. And if you see the entropy going down, given the situation, just probability, uh, means you're probably watching the video in reverse. Remember this? Entropy, it's N plus trope, it's internal growth. The direction of entropy, uh, the direction of entropy growth, is like an arrow of time for the universe. This is interesting because if you zoom way in on fundamental particles bouncing around, you won't be able to tell future from past, forward uh, versus uh, backward. You know, particles, you'll see little particles bouncing off of each other. And if you play the tape in reverse, it'll look the same. It's only when you zoom out at whole macro states that you begin to see things like entropy and you see the entropy grow in one direction of time, uh, but shrink if you imagine watching the video in reverse. So the growth of entropy tells us which way is forward in time. This is the famous second law of thermodynamics. Something about physics, second laws tend to be more important than first laws. I don't quite know why that is. Um, the first law of thermodynamics, the third law of thermodynamics, they're not as widely known. The second law, this is the second law, that uh, the arrow of time that entropy tends to increase as you move forward in time. What does all this mean for the universe as a whole? Well, it means that if you take a snapshot of the macro state of the whole universe at every moment in time, and you were to, maybe you take all the snapshots and you drop them on the floor and now they're all out of order. Well, if you put them back in, in, into an order arranged from lowest entropy to highest entropy, you'd get the correct cosmic timeline from past to future. Okay? So there, there's this sort of overall development of the universe. But wait, does this mean that you, you can't lower the entropy in, in your home? <laughs> That'd be a problem, right? No, you can clean up. <sighs> Good. But it will require effort. Sorry. And you'll need to throw out trash. You'll need to generate heat in the process. So the overall entropy of the universe will still grow, even if you make the entropy in your local little home go down. But for an object with a huge entropy, right, you'll never succeed in reducing it. Example, suppose you, try to, you scramble an egg. An egg is a macroscopic object uh, made up of many, many, many particles. If you scramble it, you will drastically increase its entropy. Go ahead and try to unscramble it. Okay? This is the fundamental difficulty with trying to decrease the entropy of a very complicated object. It's just probabilistically incredibly difficult to imagine doing it. We call these situations thermodynamically irreversible. Now, a hypothetical inverted object going backward in time would therefore have a decreasing entropy. That is, if it evolved in reverse, its entropy would have to go down. But merely reversing the entropy of the object, that's not enough to actually make it go backward in time. There are a lot of ways to reduce the entropy of something. You'd have to reverse its microstate development in exactly the right way to actually have it evolve backward in time. It's not enough just to lower its entropy again. And here's a case in point. Right. Here's a system with a low entropy. It's a snowflake. Isn't that a beautiful snowflake? If you allow it to melt, its entropy goes up. A puddle of water has a much, much higher entropy. It's a much more disordered state of the same fundamental water molecules. If I try to lower its entropy again, but I'm not careful, what I will get is an ice cube. An ice cube has a lower entropy. Every refrigerator that freezes things, it lowers the entropy of things. But merely lowering the entropy is not enough. You've got to do something much more sophisticated, which is why we haven't figured out today how to invert objects. So what have we learned here? Oh, well, hopefully, what have we learned here? Please. Don't try to stop your grandparents from eating. An object going forward, then backward in time, looks to us like multiple objects appearing and disappearing in pairs. 
Entropy counts up possibilities, and its growth points in the direction of what we call the future. Probabilistically, the universe tends toward increasing entropy. These are the takeaways. Thank you. Enjoy the film.